Welcome to the OrthoClips podcast series where we're going to discuss the latest hot topics and high impact papers in orthopedic surgery. I'm your host, Saqib Rahman. Let's get this episode started. Welcome to a new season of the OrthoClips podcast series. Before we get into this episode, I'm going to discuss what we're going to be doing this season. It's a little different. I'm going to be using some artificial intelligence podcast hosts. Uh, So before I turn it over to the AI hosts, I'll give a brief introduction of the topic. Uh, What you're going to notice with the AI hosts is that They are very conversational, very engaging, humorous at times. The discussion is perhaps a little bit more on the layperson's side. So I'll try to start it off by giving a little bit of context and then turn it over to them. But I think these are going to be good topics on timely issues based on the medical literature. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about preoperative skin preparation uh, for surgery, iodine versus chlorhexidine. Uh, There were two really important papers you should be aware of. One is in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, February 1st, 2024. Uh, This was the PREPARE trial called uh, Skin Antisepsis Before Surgical Fixation of Extremity Fractures by the PREPIT Investigators. And this was a uh, large um, cluster randomized crossover trial at 25 hospitals in the United States and Canada where they randomly ins- assigned hospitals to use either a 0.7% iodine povacrylics and 74% isopropyl alcohol. And that was the iodine group versus 2% chlorhexidine gluconate and 70% isopropyl alcohol. And that was like the chlorhexidine group for preoperative antisepsis for surgical procedures for extremity fracture, ORIF, and fixation procedures. And then every two months, the hospitals had to alternate uh, their interventions. And then the primary outcome, and they looked at both closed and open fractures, and the primary outcome was surgical site infection uh, within 30 days or uh, deep infection within 90 days. And then secondary outcome was unplanned reoperation. And they looked at six over 6,000 patients with closed fractures and 1,700 patients with open fractures. And I encourage you to go and look at the results in New England Journal. Conclusions were that, uh, at least in the closed fractures, the iodine alcohol solution had fewer surgical site infections than chlorhexidine and alcohol. And with open fractures, it was similar. The other trial that we're including in this podcast discussion was from the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, also 2024, volume 332, number seven. Uh, So this was a um, study from Switzerland. This was a multi-center, the authors were in Switzerland. It's a multi-center cluster randomized investigator masked crossover non-inferiority trial of four, over 4,000 patients at uh, three different hospitals in Switzerland over a couple of years. This was not orthospecific. This, they actually looked at uh, abdominal and cardiac surgery. But nevertheless, the title of the trial was Povidone Iodine versus Chlorhexidine Gluconate in Alcohol for Pre-Op Skin Antisepsis, a Randomized Control Trial. Interestingly, they found that povidone iodine in alcohol as skin antisepsis was non-inferior to chlorhexidine gluconate in alcohol in preventing SSIs after cardiac or abdominal surgery. So interesting implications because these skin preps are available pretty universally. This is interesting because these kind of findings will have global implications. And uh, currently the WHO, uh, last I checked, had a strong recommendation to use chlorhexidine. So we may see that change. So at this point, I'm going to let the AI hosts take over. And uh, here we go with this uh, new podcast. Welcome to the deep dive. Today, um, we're going to be diving into some fascinating research on preventing surgical site infections. Yeah, this is a topic that deserves a lot of attention. It really does. And, you know, I I have to admit, I'm ready to, like, metaphorically scrub in. Well, I'm glad you're excited about this. We're going to be talking about those pesky infections that can happen after surgery. Right, those SSIs. Exactly, SSIs. And we're going to be looking at whether iodine or chlorhexidine is better at preventing them. 
Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. Okay. For those of us who maybe haven't been to med school. Right. What exactly are surgical site infections and like, why should we care? Okay, so imagine you've just had surgery, right? Everything went well, mm -hmm. but then the area around where they made the incision starts to get red and swollen, maybe a little bit painful. Ooh, not good. No, not good. That, my friend, could be an SSI. Great. And, and they're not as uncommon as you might think. Really? Yeah, it's more common than you'd think. Wow, so it's like... It's like getting any other kind of infection, but in this case, it happens after you've had surgery. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, they can really have a big impact on your recovery. Oh, I bet. Yeah, we're talking longer hospital stays, increased healthcare costs, and in some cases, even the risk of more surgeries. Oh, that's the last thing you want. I know, right? Not exactly a souvenir you want to be taking home from the hospital. No, not at all. So that's why this research you sent is so important, you know, being able to prevent these infections in the first place. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's all about stacking the deck in your favor. Right? Exactly. Exactly. OK, so we're talking about iodine versus chlorhexidine. Now, I know these are both antiseptics used to clean the skin before surgery. Right. But can you give us like a quick, you know, 101 on how they actually work? Sure. Sure. So you usually encounter these as alcohol based solutions. Right. And the alcohol is really the workhorse here. It kills a broad spectrum of bacteria. Okay. And because it evaporates so quickly, it's perfect for using in the operating room. It's amazing to think that just like wiping the skin with an antiseptic can make such a difference. It really is. It's one of those simple but powerful things. Yeah. But here's the question. Is one of these antiseptics better than the other? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Right. And this is where the research you shared gets really interesting because one study, the PREPARE trial, really took a deep dive into this. Yes. Specifically, they looked at patients who were having surgery for bone fractures. So we're talking about like surgeries where they use plates and screws to repair a broken bone. Exactly, exactly. Now, they divided these patients into two groups, those with closed fractures where the bone is broken but doesn't break the skin, and those with open fractures where the bone actually pokes through. Okay, so like a compound fracture, we've all seen those on TV. Exactly. And this difference turned out to be super important. Okay, I'm sensing a plot twist here. Maybe, maybe. So for the closed fracture group, they found something pretty interesting. Iodine pavacrolex, which is a specific type of iodine solution, was actually more effective at preventing SSIs than chlorhexidine. Wow. Okay, so iodine for the win, at least in that case. Well, hold on. For the patients with open fractures, okay. there was actually no significant difference in infection rates between the two groups. Okay, now I'm really intrigued. We've got iodine coming out on top for closed fractures, but no clear winner for open fractures. Why is that? Well, that's the million-dollar question. And while this study doesn't give us a definitive answer, there are some clues. Ooh, lay it on me. <laughs> okay, so first, think about how closed and open fractures are treated differently. With a closed fracture, the skin is still intact, right? It's like a natural barrier. Right. But with an open fracture, you've got that broken bone sticking out, which means there's already a pathway for bacteria to get in. That makes sense. And open fractures often happen out in the field, right? Which means there's more time for bacteria to settle in before the person even gets to the hospital. And I bet those bacteria are not just sitting around. They can start forming those biofilms, which are like... What did you call them? Impenetrable fortresses. Exactly. Biofilms are a major challenge when it comes to preventing infections. So even if you clean the wound and apply an antiseptic, those biofilms can act like a shield, protecting the bacteria underneath. You got it. And this is where the specific properties of iodine pavacrylex might give it an edge, at least in the case of closed fractures. Okay, how so? Well, this type of iodine solution is designed to stick around longer and provide more sustained protection. Oh, interesting. It's got better adhesion to the skin, and it releases iodine over a longer period. So even if there's a bit of a delay in getting to surgery, it's still doing its job. Okay, so that might explain why it seems to outperform chlorhexidine mm -hmm. in those closed fracture cases. It's like the long-lasting protection you need when you've got that intact skin barrier. It's okay, so we've got this intriguing finding about iodine pavacrolex doing better for closed fractures but not for open fractures. It really highlights how important it is to consider the specifics of each situation, right? Absolutely. One size does not fit all, especially in surgery. For sure. For sure. And this is where things get even more interesting. Oh. Because the PREPARE trial, 
That was all about bone fractures, but what about other types of surgeries? Good question. And that's where a Swiss study comes in. Okay, let's hear it. Did they put iodine and chlorhexidine head to head too? They did, but this time they focused on people having heart and abdominal surgeries. They did, yeah, they yeah. looked at those two, but this time it was all about heart surgeries and abdominal surgeries, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so totally different from the bone fractures we were talking about yeah, before. Yeah, totally. Did they use the same kind of iodine? Good question. They actually used povidone iodine for this one. Povidone iodine. Yeah, and they compared it to chlorhexidine gluconate, so kind of similar setup to that last study. Hmm. Okay, so same contenders, different game, what they find. Well, get this. They found that povidone iodine, it worked just as well as the chlorhexidine in preventing infections. Oh, interesting. So no clear winner this time. Nope. Hmm. But I thought, weren't there like guidelines out there saying, hey, use chlorhexidine for this stuff? You're totally right. The World Health Organization, they actually have a strong recommendation for using chlorhexidine. Huh. So for them to find that povidone iodine was just as good? That's kind of a big deal then. Yeah, it really shakes things up a bit. It really does. Because for one thing, I mean, surgeons and patients, they've got options, right? Right. And this is especially important when you think about places where money is tight, mm. you know, resource limited settings. Yeah. Povidone iodine, it's often way cheaper and you can actually get a hold of it easier in those places. That makes a lot of sense. So it's like a win-win if it's just as effective. Exactly. This study really challenges the idea that chlorhexidine is the only way to go. Yeah. You know, it gives us some reassurance that povidone iodine, even if it doesn't always get top billing, can really hold its own. I like that. It's like the underdog antiseptic. Huh. I like that. The underdog antiseptic. But OK, I got to ask, why is there this discrepancy then? If it's just as good in some cases, why the strong push for chlorhexidine? Well, the researchers in the Swiss study, they actually addressed that. Yeah. They pointed out that some of that early research, the stuff that led to those recommendations, it might not have been the best quality, you know. Oh, really? Like maybe some flaws in the studies or something? Yeah, exactly. It's a good reminder that science, it's a process, right? We're always learning, always refining what we thought we knew. Makes sense. And sometimes the old research needs a fresh look. Totally. And that's what's happening here. The Swiss study, it was really well designed, focused on these specific types of surgeries. So it adds a whole new layer to this whole debate. OK, yeah, that makes sense. And it really drives home a point we keep seeing. This yeah. whole iodine or chlorhexidine question, it's not a simple either. -er. Right. It might depend on the surgery, the patient. Heck, even how these antiseptics are formulated can make a difference. Yeah, we were talking about all those different factors earlier. It's not just one thing. Exactly. OK, so we've got the PREPARE trial that's saying, hey, this type of iodine, it's looking good for those closed fractures. Then we've got the Swiss study that's saying, hold on, povidone iodine, it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with chlorhexidine for these other surgeries. Yeah. It's like this ongoing match, you know? Huh. That's a great way to put it. And it gets even better because you know that editorial you shared. Yeah, yeah. That really digs into this back and forth in the research about which antiseptic is the reigning champ. Oh, yeah. It's like a real tug of war. One minute, it's all about chlorhexidine. The next, it's iodine's time to shine. What's going on there? Well, part of it, like we've been saying, is that different studies are looking at such different surgeries. Right. It's not really fair to compare like a knee replacement to a heart surgery when it comes to infection risk. Right. Exactly. And even within a category, like say heart surgery, there's a ton of variation. A simple hernia repair, that's a whole different ball game than open heart surgery. Right, right. So yeah, the type of surgery, it definitely matters. Okay, so what else is going on? Well, another thing is the way they make these antiseptics, the formulations, they can be pretty different. It's not just iodine versus chlorhexidine, you know? Oh, so it's more nuanced than that. Way more nuanced. You've got different concentrations, different alcohols they use, even other stuff they throw in there. All that can change how well it works. Huh. So it's like comparing apples and oranges sometimes. Sometimes it really is. And that makes it tough to look at all these studies together and be like, boom, this one's the winner. Yeah, for sure. So type of surgery, how they make the stuff. What else do we need to think about when we're looking at this research? Well, we also got to factor in the patient themselves. Oh, right. Like some people, they just get infections easier no matter what you clean them with. Exactly. We're talking age, overall health. Do they smoke? Do they have diabetes? All that plays a role. Right. Like if someone's immune system isn't in tip-top shape, they might be more likely to have problems. Exactly. It's like their own body's defenses aren't as strong. So we've got all these things at play here. It's like a three-ring circus. The patient, what's going on in the hospital, the surgery itself, 
and then the antiseptic on top of it all. Ah. Uh, it really is a lot to keep track of. It is. It's no wonder this whole topic has sparked so much debate, right? Oh, yeah. It just goes to show how much we're still learning about preventing infections. It's true. There's always something new to uncover. Okay, so we've we've gone over a lot. And I have to say, this whole iodine versus chlorhexidine thing, it's it's a lot more complicated than I thought it would be. It really is. And, you know, it's a perfect example of how, with medical research, there's always more to the story, you know? Totally, totally. It's like those, uh, those Russian nesting dolls. You open one and there's like... A million more inside. Ah, uh, exactly. And speaking of more, this is making me think about all those other things that could affect someone's risk of getting an SSI. Like, you can't just be about what you use to clean the skin, right? What about the hospital itself? Oh, absolutely. The hospital environment plays a huge role. Right, because, like, what if you have the cleanest skin in the world, but then they operate with, like, a rusty scalpel, you're still going to have problems. Exactly. It's about minimizing the bacteria everywhere. You know, the air, the surfaces, the instruments, everything. So what kind of stuff do hospitals actually do to keep things clean? Well, it's it's a whole system, you know. They've got s special ventilation to filter the air. They sterilize everything like crazy. And hand washing, oh my gosh, they're all about the hand washing. Right, like those signs they have everywhere. Everywhere. And it's not just the surgeons, it's everyone. The nurses, the anesthesiologists, everyone's got to be on their a game. So it's really a team effort. 100%. Everyone's got to be on the same page when it comes to preventing infections. Okay. So that's the hospital side of things. But then there's the patient themselves, right? Like yeah. we were talking about how some people are just more prone to infections. Exactly. Age, overall health, do they have diabetes, all that factors in. Right. Right. It's like their defenses might not be as strong. Exactly. It all comes back to the immune system in the end. Okay. So okay. we've got the patient, we've got the hospital, we've got the surgery itself. And then we've got the antiseptic on top of it all. It's it's almost overwhelming how many things are at play. It's a lot. But that's why this research is so important, right? The more we understand all these different pieces, the better we can protect people. That's a great point. It's not just about one magic solution. It's about all these different things working together. Exactly. It's about taking a holistic approach, you know, considering everything. I like that holistic approach. You're going to use that. Uh, go for it. Well, this has been amazing. You know, I thought we were going to be talking about iodine and chlorhexidine, and that was it. But it's so much bigger than that. It always is, right? It really is. And I think it's so important for people to realize that, to know that there are all these factors at play. Mm -hmm. It's not just one thing. I agree. Knowledge is power, right? 100%. Well, on that note, I think we're about out of time. But this has been an amazing deep dive. So thank you so much for... Uh, for diving in with me. Anytime. I always enjoy a good deep dive, especially on a topic this important. Me too. And for everyone listening, thanks for joining us. And remember, stay curious. Mm -hmm.